What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Cosmic Wonder. I'm your host, Warren, and wow, what an episode of X-Men 97. Probably the best one today, probably tied with the first one for the best episode, but go ahead and right away, rank it in the comments down below. Let me know what you thought about this episode. If you caught my live stream last night for the watch party, you know that I was completely shocked, as I'm sure most people were, with how this ended. And if you haven't seen it, spoiler alert, we are diving right into all of the spoilers for X-Men 97 episode 5. So episode 5 is titled Remember It. And this is a pretty big theme throughout the entire episode, but unfortunately it was also the last words of Gambit. A tragic final moment for Gambit, especially after everything he just went through with Rogue in this episode. However, Remember It is also referring to Scott and Jean and Madeline Pryor, but also at the same time to Rogue and Magneto, all of them remembering their past. Also, not to mention after the end of this episode, Remember It could be referring to Genosha and the huge attack that takes place at the end. This episode opens with Trish Tilby at the X Mansion doing an interview and a piece about the X-Men. Genosha is officially going to become a part of the UN, so she's interviewing most of the X-Men at the X-Mansion, with the exception of Magneto, Rogue, and Gambit. Now, later on in the episode, they tell us that Gambit only tagged along to go to Genosha because he heard that Magneto invited Rogue and she said yes. And since they were in a love triangle at that moment, he didn't want Magneto and Rogue to be alone, so he went with them. Everybody else, for the most part, is still at the X-Mansion. Now, a few interesting things about the beginning. Trish makes Beast blush. And in the comics, they are actually involved in a romantic relationship with each other. But eventually, Beast would go on to believe that she betrayed him and would dump her. Another interesting factor here is that they actually know that the X-Men estate is a school for mutants here. So it's no longer a secret. They're completely out of the bag. They have let the world know this is the school for mutants. They specifically say that it was founded by the late Professor Charles Xavier, and they show us a picture of the X-Men first class that seems to be no longer broken and back up on the wall. Again, we have Professor X, Beast, Angel, Jean Grey, who was also Marvel Girl at the time, Cyclops, and Iceman, the X-Men first class. But then during this piece, they show footage of Cyclops, and notice he is sleeping on the couch. More on this in just a bit, but then, this is really important, notice that they show Roberto slash Sunspot and Jubilee on the couch together. This is important because, remember, his parents do not know that he is a mutant, and they are probably going to see this, and this is probably going to tell them Roberto is a mutant. If not, he was at least there associating with them. So this this scene right here will probably cause some friction with his family later on. But back to Cyclops sleeping on the couch. In another scene here in this interview, we can see that Cyclops and Jean are in the kitchen together, not really talking, and this goes on to be later addressed in this episode, that the two really haven't communicated since the event with Madeline happened. In fact, there's so much tension right now that he is sleeping on the couch, not even sleeping in the same room as his wife, because he's not sure if that's actually his wife, if it was Jean or if it was the clone, Madeline. Trish concludes by stating that Genosha is joining the UN. And then we go off to the Blackbird and we see Magneto, Rogue, and Gambit. We hear Magneto tell Gambit that in case the Blackbird explodes, just a reminder, you're the only person on board for whom gravity would most certainly be an issue. Basically stating, Gambit, you can't fly. Rogue and I can fly due to our powers. But of course, we all know Rogue would save him. This is just showing us the tension between the three of them because Gambit and Magneto both want Rogue, and Rogue does want both of them at the same time as well. So she's very conflicted, which we see throughout this episode. We get to Genosha and we see two two giant statues of Professor X and Magneto, the two who are believed to be the founding fathers, essentially, the leaders of the mutants in one way or another. And when we go in, we can see that there are actually signs of Magneto, his M, everywhere, and pictures of him with the words freedom on it, showing us that a lot of mutants do support Magneto, which is why Genosha is going to pick him to be the leader. We go in further to Genosha, we can see Leech, the Morlock, we can see him next to Pixie. We can also see Glob, who is there, who you can see into his skin because it's made of wax. That's why you can see his skeleton. And there are so many mutants throughout this entire episode. It's really awesome to see all of these cool little Easter eggs. And we'll talk about a lot more mutants as we go on in this video. As Magneto, Rogue, and Gambit come to land, they see more of Genosha. That shows a lot more support for Magneto. We see signs that say Magneto is right. We see welcome X-Men. And just a general happy, healthy, excited vibe. All the mutants here feel safe at Genosha. And they are happy to have the X-Men on their side and Magneto leading them. Now when they arrive, to our surprise, we see Magneto. Madeline Pryor greeting them. Honestly, I didn't think we were going to see her again, but I'm glad they kept her in here because it makes for a crazy good story. But we find out that she is on the interim council of Genosha because they wanted an X-Men and she jokes they could spare a Jean, joking that she is a clone of Jean. 
Then enter Nightcrawler. Everyone was super excited about this, including myself. Now he welcomes Rogue and Gambit very excitedly. This is because in the animated series, they actually save his life, which is why he's super happy to see them and which is why he gets pretty deep with Gambit over this episode, basically telling him, you love her, you need to marry her, get over your fears. When Rogue and Gambit go along teleporting with Nightcrawler, they see what Genosha really is and how it turned out. And Rogue says it's just like he said it would be, of course, referring to Magneto. Because essentially what Genosha is now is the vision that Magneto had, except he really wants it to be the entire world, X-Men and mutants being free and safe and ruling, really, the entire world. Rogue lies and said that she was talking about Professor X, but this, of course, is setting up a whole big scene where she actually reveals to us the past which her and Magneto have together, because at this point, Gambit still doesn't know about her and Magneto's previous relationship. Then as they're wandering around, we hear somebody start singing, and we can see a few people dancing. We have Multiple Man, who was a part of X Factor. Then we have Dazzler, and right now, there's a rumor that Dazzler could appear in Deadpool and Wolverine. Even a rumor that Taylor Swift could possibly be playing Dazzler due to her very, very close relationship with Blake Lively and Ryan Reynolds. However, this is just a rumor at this time, not confirmed. Now back at the X-Mansion, Cyclops kind of drops the ball with the interview. He's already on edge due to the whole Jean Madeline situation, and of course, his son being taken away to the future so he could survive. He's still dealing with losing a son, and this is a really important detail to notice because it comes into play later on in this episode, and I'm assuming in episode seven is going to play a huge factor as well. And not to burst anybody's bubble, but just so everybody knows, next episode is titled Life Death Part Two. So it's going to be about Storm, Storm getting her powers back. So the next episode that we're getting is not going to give us any type of resolution for what happened in this episode. Unfortunately, we have to wait two weeks from now. But while Cyclops is doing the interview and Trish is talking about him and Jean being a couple, we see Jean is off avoiding interview questions in which Wolverine joins her because he is doing the same. Here we learn that the two of them still are not talking at all. And she specifically states he is grieving his son. And keep in mind, this is not Jean's son. It is Madeline's son. Madeline is the one who birthed Nathan, not Jean. So it's not Cyclops and Jean's son. It's Cyclops and Madeline's son. That is very important to note. Even though Madeline is a clone of Jean, it is still not Jean's son. Son. Here she tells Wolverine that she's trying to remember, going back to the title of this episode, remember it. She basically says that she remembers so much and so much to do with her and Scott, everything that they've been through. But again, she just doesn't know when she was switched, when Mr. Sinister grabbed her and cloned her and replaced her with Madeline Pryor. Then Cyclops and Jean both are telling the story at the same time of a very important part of their relationship when Jean had the Phoenix Force and she wanted to leave. However, she had this moment with Scott where she used the power of the Phoenix Force to keep his powers from coming out of his eyes to where he could look at her without actually shooting energy beams and she could actually see his true eyes. This was a very specific moment that Jean decided to stay. And of course, eventually they would go on to endure a lot together. However, that is the conflict right now. She is wondering, whose memories are those. However, at this point in time, I believe most people agree that Jean was taken and cloned after the whole Phoenix saga. So I believe that that moment that her and Cyclops had was really between the two of them and not Madeline. Now, in her moment of weakness with everything going on with Cyclops not talking to her, Cyclops having a baby with Madeline Pryor and losing that baby, in a moment of weakness, Jean kisses Logan, who of course we know has been in love with her basically forever, as long as he's known her. But this shows how much of a good guy Wolverine actually is. He said, you're Jean Grey, he's Scott Summers, those are the rules. You just forgot him for a second. Go find him. And this is just basically stating that Jean and Scott are one of the most iconic Marvel couples out there. They're right up there with Reed and Sue, MJ and Peter. And we talked a bunch about these in the live stream last night. It was really fun. Thanks to everybody for joining. But when Cyclops is doing the interview, he recalls the doctor telling him that he wouldn't operate on his wife. He wouldn't deliver the baby. And these memories, again, the title, remember it, are bringing back really bad feelings. And they're reminding him that, you know what? Mutants aren't like people. They're nothing alike like. Not only that, but the X-Men have been fighting to protect humans while the humans have been against mutants, mostly. So he gets mad and kind of blows the interview. Now we thought Jean kissing Logan was bad and Cyclops blowing the interview was bad, but wow, we were in for a lot more in this episode. Now back at Genosha, we now have the Council of Genosha. This consists of Sebastian Shaw, who is oftentimes a villain, right there along with Emma Frost, both of which are from the Hellfire Club. And at one point in time, Magneto, Storm, Madeline Pryor, and Sunspot were also a part of. Also a part of the council is Callisto of the Morlocks, and this is Moira McTaggart, who had a romantic relationship with Professor X. Most people would probably recognize her character and her relationship with Professor X from the Fox X-Men First Class films. 
We also have Banshee, Sean Cassidy there as well. And this scene gets really interesting because essentially they say, Magneto, we want you to be our king. Now, Magneto doesn't really care for politics or diplomacy. And he asks, isn't there anybody else y'all could get? And Myra pretty much says, yeah, we'd rather have Professor X, but he's not here. And also he trusted you, so we're going to trust you. Sebastian Shaw also notes that most of the mutants out there are behind Magneto due to his publicity stunt, which was really in fact his trial. But since he showed restraint and did not kill anybody, it's due to him that Genosha is now being a part of the UN. Magneto reminisces about the time where he met Professor X and when they became best friends and started to dream about a future for the mutants. He said they both thought they would die before they saw essentially what was happening there in Genosha. So no doubt due to this sentiment that he was feeling for his old friend Charles Xavier, he says, fine, I'll be the king of Genosha. However, there's one condition. Now this is where really everything kind of in this episode starts to hit the fan. Magneto explains to Rogue that his one one condition was that Rogue be his queen. And he spouts out a lot about, this was Professor X's design. This is why he left me the X-Men. I didn't want to rule. He wanted me to. And she basically says, you're full of crap. You love me. And this was a trick that you did to get me. And what she basically says, look, I'm not going to deny my passion for you. Yes, I'm in love with you. You make me, a broken man, like Gambit, feel whole. But I also think you are going to make a great leader. So yes, I do have feelings for you. I'm passionately in love with you. But at the same time, he does believe that the two of them would make great rulers. And yeah, it's kind of a very sly plan for Magneto, but hey, he took a shot and it almost worked out, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Meanwhile, the next scene is extremely important for the future events of this episode. Not only this episode, but future ones to come. We see who we think is Gene and Scott together. Scott is venting. He's saying, I blew it with the interview. But we know, because of course it's revealed, that this is Madeline. So what you have to keep in mind for this scene here is that Scott knows this is Madeline, 100%. So when he says some things are worth holding on to, he isn't talking about him and Gene. He is very specifically talking about him and Madeline because he's very much in love with Gene and Madeline. But remember, Madeline is the actual mother of his son, not Gene. Now, the other really important part of the scene is that Madeline asks him to describe Nathan. She obviously knows what he looked like. It was her son too, but she asks Scott to describe him so he can calm down and feel something good describing his son, talking about his son. And they specifically talk about his eyes and his hair. This is how Madeline later on is able to recognize that Cable is in fact act her son. We'll get to that in just a bit. But of course, Jean comes and reveals that it's Madeline that Scott is talking to. They're talking psychically. And even though Jean just kissed Logan, she obviously feels very betrayed. And you have to realize what Jean is going through at the time as well. She doesn't really know what's her memory, what's Madeline's memory. She doesn't know. But she is in love with Scott. So it does hurt to see that Scott is kind of in love with her and Madeline as well. It's a very tricky situation. All sides are completely understandable, but it is pretty ironic that she got super pissed off after kissing Logan. She's mad at Scott for kind of cheating with her when she just cheated on him. But again, in this situation, it's not a black and white type of thing. And when they fight, ultimately Scott says, are you actually in love with me? Do you feel in love with me? Or is it just something that you remember? I don't care about your memories. How do you feel right now? now. And again, he expresses that he loves them both, but keep in mind, Madeline is the mother of his child. There's also a really interesting scene back at the council. Jean essentially kicks Madeline out of Scott's head. When this happens, Sebastian Shaw and Emma Frost both notice something happened. Now, Sebastian doesn't know, and Madeline says, my mind just drifted for a moment, but Emma Frost is a telepath. She could probably read her mind and know exactly what she was doing, which is why it shows Emma Frost. Also notice it doesn't show her eyes, just her mouth, so it could focus on her mouth. Mouth, she says, mind drift indeed. Then she smirks. So I believe Emma Frost was reading her mind and knows exactly what was happening. And considering the fact that Sebastian Shaw and Emma Frost are probably not all too good, this might come into play later because I do believe the events that happen in this episode at the end are going to be reversed, which we're about to get into. Now, essentially, Rogue is going to agree to marry Magneto. At least that's what she is telling Gambit as she explains to Gambit her history with Magneto. She says her evil mother was helping her with her powers after she ran away from her dad. Now, her evil mother is actually Mystique, which is why she said her mother knew a fella who could help her because Mystique would help recruit Rogue to the brother Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. So this is how Magneto and Rogue met. And as we talked about in the last few breakdowns that we did, Rogue explains that Magneto and Rogue can actually 
touch each other. Ro can actually touch Magneto because his electromagnetic powers protected him from her touch. And if you're not aware of what Rogue's powers are, it requires skin to skin contact, but she absorbs their memories, powers, personality traits, physical talents, strength, and this basically knocks anybody that she touches unconscious or can even kill them. This plays a big part into this episode because she can actually touch Magneto, which is a really big deal for her because she can't touch Gambit. She'll hurt him and could possibly kill him. And obviously if you're in a relationship with somebody, for obvious reasons, you'd want to touch them. Kissing amongst other things. Rogue can't do that with anybody, but... Magneto, which is why she is so torn between Remy, aka Gambit, and Magneto. Now, ultimately, it is revealed that Rogue isn't going to choose Magneto. She's going to ultimately choose Gambit, because like Gambit said, some things are deeper than skin, implying that they have true love with each other, whereas Rogue just kind of loves Magneto because she can touch him and actually get something normal with him. Now, what's really unfortunate is that before Gambit dies, Rogue doesn't get a chance to tell him this. She doesn't really realize that she wants him until she is dancing with Magneto. Magneto, and she makes a hell of an entrance, but right before she does, we open up with a scene of Genosha with the sky, with the stars in the sky in space, and if you look really closely, you can see the Watcher. The Watcher appears when huge things are about to go down, but unfortunately cannot interfere, and we obviously all know what is about to happen and why the Watcher is there. So Rogue makes an incredible entrance flying in, in which Magneto flies up to her, and they show slow motion their two hands touching each other, while Gambit is watching, seeing that, indeed, they can actually touch skin to skin. And they show a lot of actual skin on skin contact, and including them kissing. But through this entire process, Rogue actually realizes that it is just the fact that she can touch Magneto that she is so drawn to him. And she tells Magneto, Remy was right, it's deeper than skin, basically telling Magneto she loves Gambit. But this is where Madeline and also Jean, because Madeline and Jean are connected, kind of receive a psychic blow because Cable arrives. It's important to note that Cable arrives and says, kill the music, he's coming. So very specifically referring to a he, because in the comics, actually, this big grand sentinel with three heads is actually what Cassandra Nova uses to attack. So some people were thinking since that this sentinel looks incredibly like the one Cassandra Nova used, it's actually her attacking, but he specifically says he, so I don't believe it's her. More than likely, it's Mr. Sinister behind the entire thing, because we've heard that he is indeed the main villain for season one, at least. Plus, also, he is responsible for creating Cable, essentially, and Cable is a big part of this episode and is going to be an even bigger part moving forward. So Cable enters our time in which Jean and Madeline both feel that. Cable is trying to tell everybody to turn the music off and they need to evacuate because he knows what's about to happen. He eventually sees his mother and she recognizes his eyes. Remember the scene with Scott and Madeline where she said, describe him to me and Scott talked about his eyes. Big foreshadowing there with this scene. So she recognizes Cable because she's known Cable from the past, but now she also realizes that Cable is in fact her son. She says, your eyes, you made it you survived because she didn't actually know if her son Nathan was going to survive. That's why she sent him to the future with Bishop to have a chance. But now it's confirmed. She knows her son survived and is actually the person she is known to be Cable. Now something happens with Cable. We hear the automated voice say access failure imminent body slide one. I'm sure they're going to explain this in further episodes, but essentially it seems like Cable's time travel device fails and it's going to bring him back to the time that he came from. Now him knowing what is about to happen says, Says, I'm so sorry, mom. Again, confirming it is indeed her son. Madeline says, sorry for what? And that is exactly when the attack begins. The master sentinel comes out and drops a bunch of other sentinels coming out of it. And unfortunately, it kills a lot of mutants. When Gambit, Rogue, and Magneto come back together, Gambit explains that the Morlocks are stuck right underneath this Master Sentinel, with no way of them getting out. And this is where Magneto says, a promise was made. And this is referring back to the episode where Magneto rescued Leech. When he showed up, Leech said, you're him. Magneto says, yes, Magneto, and I promise you, child, you shall never be afraid again. And that is the promise that Magneto is referring to right here. And it tells you just how much Magneto does care about his own. He is keeping true to his promise to Leech and the Morlocks, and he's going to go protect them. And even when the fighting is going on, Leech even says, don't worry, Callista will find us. If not, Magneto, he promised me we wouldn't have to be afraid again. Now, ultimately, Gambit and Magneto show up to save them. Then we have this incredibly epic scene. The Master Sentinel detects an Omega level threat, which of course is Magneto, who was protecting the Morlocks at the time, and it fires a huge, devastating blast at Magneto. Rogue goes to try and save Magneto, but Gambit holds him back. She 
she breaks free, but then Magneto, using his powers, grabs some metal and surrounds Rogue and Gambit in a protective shield. He looks at Leech and in German says, don't be afraid, but of course, it's majorly implied that the blast broke through Magneto's barrier and killed them all. This infuriates Rogue, the fact that Magneto is dead. She breaks out of the metal and Gambit realizes what she is about to do, take on that Master Sentinel. So he grabs a motorcycle nearby, charges it up, and hits Rogue out of the way from attacking it and also getting hit by a blast. Gambit then tries to take on the Master Sentinel himself, stating that the cards always be in his favor, and he jumps up to attack, but then it ends up stabbing him in the side. The Sentinel then says, Mutant Intruder Neutralized, in which Gambit says, the epic line now, the name's Gambit, and then he states the title of this episode, Remember It. And he charges up the pole that's connected to him and now the Sentinel, and he blows it up and kills it. But unfortunately, this scene in the episode ends with Rogue holding Gambit, touching him for the very first time, skin to skin, crying, stating, I can't feel you. So I truly do believe Gambit is dead. I believe Magneto and the others are dead as well. And about half of the mutants that were there are all dead. However, I also believe that this is all going to be reset. I believe Cable is going to try again and he's going to return at an earlier point in time and he's going to warn everybody what is about to happen and ultimately save everybody. So I think that's what we're in for. Not next week, unfortunately. Like I said, that's a storm episode, but the week after. Obviously, Cable slash Nathan, the son of Madeline and Scott, is going to be an incredibly important character. He showed up trying to save everybody before, so I believe once he fixed his time travel device, he'll show up again, but earlier because he just showed up realizing he was too late, so he'll aim for a previous point in time to then. But that is just my theory. Go ahead and let me know what you think about this in the comments down below. Do you believe Magneto, Gambit, and about half the mutants are all really dead, or do you think Cable will come back and reverse it all? Leave your thoughts in the comments down below. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe so you can stay up to date on the MCU and get more X-Men breakdowns. Also, if you subscribe and leave a comment, you're entered in our giveaway for a chance to win a PS5 or Xbox Series X. The winner picks one item and we pick one winner at the end of each month. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. And as always, thank you all so much for watching. Woof woof.